Good evening, everyone. All protocols observed. It is with great pleasure that I introduce this year's feature speaker for the 2019 UWI Guardian Group Premium Open Lecture, Professor Wendell Abel. Professor Abel is a physician, an educator, a policy advisor, and mental health disabilities advocate, both within the university and across the Caribbean. He completed his medical training at UWI, as well as at John Hopkins University in the United States. His medical background includes a doctorate in psychiatry and a master's in public health. He has continued both his work in psychiatry and public health by becoming a very well-known policy advisor and advocate on mental health issues, including influencing the next generation of physicians through his teaching at the University of the West Indies in Jamaica. In addition to his policy and advocacy work, his work to date has included being the author of 83 articles, several technical reports, and book chapters focusing on a range of mental health issues. He has played a critical role in shaping public policy for persons living with all types of disability, including mental health. And he has also worked with agencies such as the Organizations of the American States, the Pan American Health Organization, the European Union, and CARICOM, which has allowed for the facilitation of several policy and program initiatives such as the integration of medical, uh, uh, sorry, mental health into education. Professor Abel will spend tonight with all of us providing us a background on mental health issues within the Caribbean and exploring tools that can help our students build resilience. As yesterday's workshop demonstrated, tonight will provide a variety of ideas, tips, and tools that you can use within your own classroom and households. Ladies and gentlemen, I now invite you to participate in tonight's open lecture, Making a Difference in Education, Tackling Mental Health Issues. Professor Abel. Certainly, it's a pleasure to have been invited here to deliver this lecture. Let me thank Dr. Burns and her team for extending this invitation to me. I also want to thank them for the warm hospitality that they have shown, and I have been particularly, particularly been impressed by the meticulous way they have gone about the arrangement with precision and grace. This is how the University of the West Indies ought to function. Yes, we should give them a hand. I know this afternoon or evening, it's a wet Friday evening, and I want to thank you all for coming out in this large number. So give yourself a... I must commend the organizers for taking on this topic, tackling mental health issues in education. And why mental health? Mental health is important for many reasons. One, our, well, when you look at the disease pattern in the world and the Caribbean, it's shifting. We're moving away from communicable diseases to non-communicable chronic diseases. And mental health or mental disorders and substance abuse are certainly classified as chronic diseases. Another important issue is that our population is aging. And it means that people are living longer, of course, and with that comes a lot of mental health issues, depression, retirement, dealing with retirement, loneliness. So it's commendable that we've decided to deal with these issues. 
I'm going to apologize for one, with, for one reason, that it's not going to be a lecture, it's going to be a conversation. So I'm going to invite us to participate. So I know I have been given what, two hours? No, it's one hour, right? But, but um, I hope to take us through probably about half an hour, give us enough time to ask questions, to have discussions. Dr. Burns, I'm very disappointed by the introduction, you know. You said everything about me except to say I'm tall, dark, handsome. <laughs> That's just the light in the room. I'm going to pose a question to us, and I'm a psychiatrist. What do you think is the question that is often posed to me, apart from asking if I'm mad? <laughs> Well, you know, Dr. Burns asked me the question yesterday, and it is, what are your reasons for entering psychiatry? I paused, but the reason I decided to do psychiatry is simply this. My mother had a mental health problem. She had postpartum psychosis, I mean, depression. And what it means is that whenever she had a child, she would get depressed. And it turned out that when I was born, she was depressed, severely depressed. It meant that my mother... <laughs> I know what you're thinking. <laughs> There's lots more to tell you. <laughs> but my mother, because of the depression, she was not able to take care of me. She wasn't able to breastfeed. And it was my grandmother who actually took on that role. But my mother represents one in four persons who will struggle with a mental disorder in a lifetime. One in four. I want you to look to your right, look to your left, look in front, look behind. One in four, but don't make any diagnosis. have grown older, I recognize that in terms of the causes of mental disorders, the generic, genetic causes, environmental causes, all impacting on the brain. But my story just didn't end there. My youngest brother, his daughter, was diagnosed with a mental disorder at age 13. So the numbers are in, the numbers increasing in the family. And it highlights the fact that there's a genetic basis to mental disorders. But there's another factor which, it, which is highlighted here that 50% of mental disorders begin by age 14. And I'm very um, encouraged to see a number of students who are here this afternoon, and I'll be focusing a lot of my discussion on the young people. Um, I, want them, I want you to keep attuned with my presentation because I have some stress balls for you. So, do, so you, you have to keep engaged, right, because I'm going to um, pose some questions to you based on the lectures. And if you get it right, you'll get a ball, right? So <laughs> stay connected. <laughs> The data also tells us that 50% of cases of mental disorders go untreated. Now, with untreated mental disorders, um, it means that especially the young, the, 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 the more inclined to drop out of school, that greater risk for alcohol and drug use that many persons with mental disorders end up in prison. In fact, in the USA, there are more persons in prisons with mental illness. Or of the persons who are mentally ill, there are more of them in prisons than are in mental hospitals. And that's a frightening revelation. Um, that with untreated mental illness, persons are at great risk 
for unemployment. Now, earlier I pointed out that high percentage of persons um, do not get treated. And lack of treatment is often due to stigma or lack of access to care. Now, when my niece got ill at age 13, I remember it was a Friday night like tonight, my brother called and he said that his daughter was acting strange, that he went to embrace her and she withdrew and he was wondering if she was abused. And I reassured him that, you know, it could be that she's paranoid. And the following day, the Saturday morning, he called and said she was actually getting worse. And I said to him, I want you to trust me. I want you to believe me. I think her daughter is getting paranoid. She probably has paranoid schizophrenia. Take her to the hospital now. And he believed me. And by one o'clock Saturday afternoon, she was admitted to hospital at age 13. I'm proud to tell you that today my niece is actually in her final year in college, about to complete her degree in social work. But what is it that made the difference? It's the fact that my brother believed me and he trusted me. And as I think about it, I think about many patients that I've had to treat over the years. Um, they come in early age with mental disorders. You make a diagnosis and the pa parents are angry with you. They storm through the door, never come back to you. They curse. How could he make such a diagnosis? Because it's painful, it's difficult. Um, but we have to deal with stigma. And the stigma in regards to mental illness has to do with ignorance, um, that is today's society, a lot of people still think that mental disorders are due to demon possession, witchcraft. In fact, the slide shows a skull and a hole is drilling it. And ancient societies had those beliefs. And the way people would treat mental disorders is that they would drill a hole in the skull to release the demons, yes? But we still believe that today, right? Stigma is also born out of fear, yes? And these will prevent persons from seeking care. Lack of access is also a major factor contributing to persons not um, getting appropriate um, care. And in a study that we did some years ago looking at mental health services in the English-speaking Caribbean, it shows that when you look at our mental health budget, the vast majority of the money is actually spent on mental hospitals. And that is also true here in Trinidad and um, Tobago, true in Jamaica, the Bahamas, throughout the Caribbean. Limited budget spent on prevention and limited support is given to support school-based programs. Yes? And this is a challenge we face. Now, I want to shift the discussion slightly to look at mental health in a broader perspective. And that mental health, when we talk about mental health, it's not merely the absence of um, disease, but in, it includes social, emotional, and behavioral well-being. And the students, what is it? Just repeat for me, it's what? Social, emotional, behavioral well-being. Remember that now. Um, now, good mental health, when we speak about good mental health, it means that one would develop a positive self-worth. They're able to cope with the normal stresses of life. With good mental health, one is able to realize one's full potential. You're productive at work, and you can make a worthwhile and meaningful contribution to society. I'm going to pause. And the young people in the room, I want you all to say, I'm a big deal. Everybody, I'm a big deal. Louder. And I want you to tell the person next to you that you're a big deal. I know some of you wanted to say that to the person next to you before. My 
for the young people, you know what, this is about, it's positive affirmation. It's important for you to give yourself positive affirmation. And also the other persons around you, right? That's tip number one, positive affirmation. I'm a big deal. Um, I'm going to pose a question to us. What are the mental health issues faced by students? And I want the students to tell me. I'm not going to let you off the hook in. I don't want you to sleep in the room this afternoon. What are the mental health issues often faced by students? I'm, I'm, I know you're surprised that I'm walking through the room, right? What are the mental health issues? Depression. Depression, what else? And very good, what else? Stress, excellent. What else? You're going well anymore? What's that? Fair. Very good. Any more? Excellent. Low self-esteem. Well, I'll add to the list. Among the common mental health issues that young people face, stress, bullying. That's a big one. That's a new one. Yeah? Um, young people are under tremendous pressure to succeed at all levels of the educational system. Fair. Fear of failure, exam stress. Isn't that a big one? Yeah. Yes, that's why you're here, right? <laughs> Trauma, depression, drugs and alcohol, grieving associated with loss. I sometimes have to remind people when they come to my office that grieving is a normal, natural reaction. So when somebody dies, don't go to the person, say a family member that died, don't go to the person and say, oh, make yourself strong, don't cry. <laughs> Let them cry, right? It's a normal, natural reaction. That's how doctors make money, you know, I tell you this. You come to my office and, you know, you observe the patients very well and it's a, uh, uh, let's say it's a Christian lady and I look in her eyes and I see tears and I say you know what a friend we have in Jesus <laughs> help me go along what, what's the next line and you hold it there and then I say what a privilege to carry everything to God and she starts to cry and you know depending on the type of if it's a cry it's 30 US dollars <laughs> if it's uh, well in Jamaica we use holler it's maybe 50 dollars and if it's a ball then it's about what? You got it. And then I have my tissue in my pocket. I take it out. And I give it to And they wipe their tears. And say, what a good little man. And I extend my hand and I call it. You know, it's only a joke. But the point is, um, grieving, we must recognize. It's a natural, normal process. Um, suicidal behaviors, we have to deal with that in the Caribbean, and I'll get back to that. Although a lot of what we actually see is really self-harm or self-injurious behavior. And I'm going to switch to this quickly, looking at the suicide rates in terms of some selected Caribbean countries. And you see, well, the highest is actually um, Guyana, right? Trinidad is somewhere in the middle. High suicide rate. Jamaica is, is two. But you know, it's after, you know, Jamaica has a low suicide rate, but we have a what? High murder rate. We, we kill others, we don't kill ourselves. But it is still trauma. Um, but the suicide rate in Trinidad, 12.9. And when we look at the study, I mean, it's a study that was done by Professor Hutchinson here. Um, the risk factors include males, the younger age group, and so in the, among males it would be the age group 25 to 34, females 15 to 24, students and educators are at risk. That struck me. 
This is a slide showing the um, violent crimes, homicide rates in the Caribbean. You know, the Caribbean is singled out as a region with a high crime rate, homicide rate. And again, uh, my country unfortunately tops the list, but um, there's Trinidad. You know, we do have a, a problem in these countries. Um, the Bahamas. Think about the Bahamas is they don't report their crime figures. Yes? Um, but the point I'm making is that crime violence remains a problem in the society. Yesterday, in fact, interestingly, we did an activity. And I was actually surprised at the number of persons who reported that they've been exposed to some form of trauma in the society. I was really shocked. I didn't realize that so many persons were affected. Um, show of hands, let me see those who've experience trauma in one form or another in the society. Well, I have, what about? Yeah, quite a few persons. Domestic violence, a problem. Sexual abuse. This is a big one in Caribbean society. And I'm going to spend some time later looking at abuse and sexual abuse. Now, the drug use. Um, we've been doing, you know, every three to five years, more five years we do studies looking at drug use among our secondary school students. And the last one that was done was 2016. And what it showed was in terms of lifetime prevalence, which means ever use. We asked the students in the secondary school, have you ever used alcohol in one form or another? and 67%, well, we could round off the numbers for ease. About 70% of them said we use it at least once. And the once could be, um, well, I know in, in Jamaica, when, when we make carrot juice and sour sap juice, you know, sometimes they put a little alcohol in it, you know, at Christmas, um, the fruit cake and all of that sort of thing. Sorry, yes, with alcohol. Um, so about 70% of students say, yes, we've used. Um, tobacco, 30%. And cannabis, marijuana, it's at 17%, right? And when you look at the data, and I'm going to tell you, which country do you think has the highest um, cannabis use? No. It actually, the use is actually higher in countries like St. Lucia, Dominica, St. Vincent. Um, Look at the data today. Um, but the point is, I mean, with these figures that drug use is still a cause for concern in the Caribbean, countries like Trinidad, certainly Jamaica, all throughout, right? Especially among our young people. And this is a study. I did some analysis of the data and we asked, why do adolescents take drugs? And these are some of the answers they gave. To fit in, to feel good, to feel better, to do better, to experiment. And you know what was coming a lot out of this data? That they're using drugs to treat their pain. They're self-medicating. And I remember we presented this at a symposium and an educator said, you know, clearly we're not teaching our students, our young people, we're not giving them enough skills to cope and to deal with their pain. And, you know, I want to leave this thought with us that addiction begins and ends with pain. And what we have to do is treat the pain. Far too often parents will come in and they say, my son is using marijuana. Doctor, do something. And when you listen, it's usually pain. Pain in the family, personal pain, and where we need to focus on. I usually say to parents, let's choose our battles and choose them well. We need to focus on the pain. Broken homes, parents too busy to attend to their children, we have to deal with the pain. Addiction begins and ends with pain. I'm going to shift a little again to look at the first thousand days. And a lot of work has been done in 
over the years looking at the first thousand days of life. And the first thousand days would, in, would start from conception to the end of age two. Um, increasingly, we're now recognizing the significance of the first thousand days in life. Um, and from a mental health point of view, what the data tells us is that if the attachment is secure, bonding is secure, and the child gets a lot of stimulation, then that child will grow up with a um, great level of self-esteem, will be a happier child, and that child is going to be able to relate to others better. And you probably ask, what then became, what has become of you? Your mother had postpartum depression. Um, <laughs> The attachment was not secure, bonding was disrupted, but my grandmother substituted, yes? And we have to thank the grandmothers and the extended families that play a great role. Any grandmother here? Let's recognize them because our extended, I see you waving happily, yes? The, it's a, it speaks to the role of the extended family in caring for children in the community. But. Yes, in the first thousand days, it's important. They are critical period. There are so many things that will affect the development of the brain and the child's development. Nutrition is also an important one, yes? Um, and what we've also learned is that if there are problems in the first thousand days, insecure attachment, lack of stimulation, chronic stress, violence, right? then children who experience these are likely to finish fewer grades in school. In other words, they're not going to success, I mean succeed as well. They earn less in life and they have poor health outcome. The first thousand days are critical. And so what I'm saying to us as policymakers, educators, everybody, is that a strong start in life guarantees success. Poor start is going to compromise the development of the child. And so we have to pay more attention to the first thousand days. And peer, it means we have to pay more attention to parenting, not prison. And focus on parenting education, investing early childhood education, right? Very important. I raise another question, and it is why trauma matters. And I'm going to share some data for you. I hope I, with you, I hope I'm not overwhelming you with too much data. But this is a famous study that was done in the USA, Adverse Childhood Experience Study. And what they did was they looked at 1,700 adults in the USA, and they were asked about adverse childhood experiences. And we also looked, they also looked at certain life issues, for example, learning challenges, health outcome, mental health issues, and substance abuse. And when we talk about um, adverse childhood experiences, there are really three types. Abuse, whether it's physical, emotional, sexual abuse, neglect, um, household dysfunction. So the abuse is emotional, physical, sexual neglect, emotional or physical neglect. Household um, dysfunction, for example, mother experiencing violence, mental, uh, mental illness within the family, alcohol, drug use within the family, having a family member, for example, father incarcerated. And the findings coming out of this study indicate that children are exposed to a wide range of trauma and that 59% of the adults were actually exposed to at least one of these adverse childhood experiences. The data also indicate that trauma impacts on life. Why do mean? It affects education, that is exposure to trauma, health, mental health, social function, and that the more trauma children experience, the greater the impact. And we're now beginning to recognize that trauma does in fact affect brain development. Um, 
children who are exposed to chronic trauma, experience major academic problems, and some of them may actually show a decrease in their IQ. The rate of learning disability is actually doubled, and there is impairment in terms of their ability to control emotions and impulses. In terms of the relationship between adverse childhood experiences and mental health, that children were exposed to trauma, lots of trauma, experience behavioral problems, mental health problems such as depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, suicide, use of alcohol, and illicit drugs. And interestingly, these adverse childhood experiences are also linked to later disease host of diseases, I'm not going to go through them, high blood pressure, obesity, um, lung cancer, and, and they're also linked to death before, the premature death before the age of 65. Additionally, exposure to these adverse childhood experiences are predictors of social problems um, such as homelessness criminal behavior, unemployment, parenting problems, family violence, and what we refer to as the intergenerational transmission of violence. That if you grow up in an environment in which you're exposed to a lot of trauma, um, violence, and so on, that you're going to transmit that across generation to your own children. And, um, and you know, what we're now finding is that trauma, chronic exposure to trauma leads to toxic stress on the brain. And part of it is that the brain is flooded with adrenaline for a long time. It becomes toxic. It's similar to revving up a car for a long period of time and the brain goes into overdrive. And you know, we, we can actually identify areas of the brain that are affected um, in children who are exposed to chronic trauma. So in societies in which we have high levels of community violence, um, high levels of sexual abuse, um, we need to be aware that it's going to impact on the development of the brain of the child. And I'll just touch on this um, quickly, effects of chronic repeated sexual abuse. In my practice, the most exhausting part of my work is to deal with children who've been exposed to sexual abuse um, for a long time, you know? And for some of these children, it starts early and it continues and it repeats itself over and over again. And um, that sometimes these individuals are the most difficult to work with because of what trauma does to the brain and does to the individual. Now I take us to the education system because to a great extent, this is a focus of our conversation this evening. And you know, the education system is an ideal context for youth intervention. It's a tremendous opportunity for us to promote positive development from an early age. Um, the representative from the Ministry of Education highlighted the need for more mental health literacy, that in our schools we need to create a culture of listening and caring. And I'm going to advocate and remind us, I know we've been doing a lot of that in the Caribbean, but I think we need to do more. We need to place greater emphasis on the life skills component in our curriculum um, to equip our young people with skills to be able to cope and to build their resilience. As an education sector and system, we need to balance that scale, right? Um, academic achievement versus mental well-being, yes? I think in the Caribbean, we're pressuring our children too much, right? You all agree? Yes. And from an early age, you know, yes? Um, we used to have, at the end of primary school, we used to have what we call the GSAT exam. I think your equivalent is now... Yes, but we used to call it giving stress at tender age. They're now, they're now changing. I think you have one for you. Somebody mentioned it um, for the SAE. Anyway, but the point is that we put our children under 
too much pressure to achieve academically and we're not investing enough to ensure their well-being. And in the long run, you know, we ask ourselves, does it really matter in the long run? Not necessarily, you know, and we see it repeat itself over and over. I work at the University of the West Indies and I see it every day. I tell you this, every time I enter a lecture room like this and if I talk about depression, as I get to the door, a lot of students just pounce on me and they say we're depressed, um, we're, we're struggling, our parents are putting us under too much pressure to do medicine and I didn't want to do medicine, I want to become an accountant and you know, but clearly as a society or as societies within the region, we're putting our children under far too much pressure. Not that academic achievement is not good, it is good, it's in good, it's important, but we have to balance that scale and it's important that we have this conversation. So when we look at mental health in our schools, there are tremendous opportunities in the school. Uh, not that we are going to turn the educational system into, or turn teachers to become therapists, because we have that discussion back home, but schools are well equipped to be able to identify um, children at risk. In fact, um, at this time of the year especially, I get most of my referrals from um, the school system that teachers, educators, guidance counselors, that when they are adequately trained and prepared, they identify, and teachers are very good at this, yes, very good to be able to identify at risk um, students. But in our school system, I think we need to do more prevention. More resources need to be directed at the school system to um, strengthen the prevention work and also to be able to do some basic level in terms of intervention. Um, of course, for more complicated and difficult cases, what we expect um, our system to do is to refer and hopefully we have adequate services for children and adolescents. But this again is a major problem we have in the Caribbean. We are short in terms of mental health professionals to serve um, children and adolescents. In fact, you know, when you look at the health system, it has, we're good at providing services for children, but the adolescent age group, um, um, in that age group we're having problems with them in terms of where to refer them to, who are the professionals who are going to take care of them. You look at the society here and, see, and count the number of child psychiatrists you have in Trinidad and Tobago, and the number of child psychologists, right? Um, very few, and this is so throughout the entire English-speaking Caribbean. And what is also true is that these professionals have a high level of burnout. In fact, on an average, they probably remain in their jobs for about four to five years, even in first world countries, where they also have a shortage. But we have to clearly invest more in professionals to, who look after our children and um, adolescents, because they are the future. Um, the school also has a responsibility to create an environment that is more encouraging and more empathetic. And we will explore that a little. Um, and so one of the things that, one, one, one area that was alluded to earlier is mental health education in schools. We have to increase awareness of mental health issues. In fact, there's a recent study that was done in the USA that showed that schools in which they implement um, mental health education, mental health literacy um, programs that children actually do better um, from a mental well-being perspective but they also seek treatment earlier because they are aware. Because good programs also help to reduce stigma, um, good programs reduce discrimination and good programs help to increase acceptance in terms of mental um, health issues. The time has come actually for us to begin to recognize that mental health problems are no different from any other problem, yes? And, and, and they should be seen as such and be treated as such. That in our school system, recognizing the challenges we face in terms of trauma in the community, trauma in the home, that our school system need to 
develop a more trauma-informed support um, system for young people. Firstly, we need to recognize the impact of trauma, and that is why I spent some time looking at that. Um, we need to create safe places in our school, safe environment for our students, and to ensure that we do not re-traumatize children. So for example, you know, if you have, and I've seen this happen in my country where a child, um, there may be an incident in the community. And what we do sometimes is bring the students to school, um, in a classroom, and we force them to talk about their experience. It is wrong. In fact, we don't do debriefing anymore. Because what you do, one of the things with trauma is that um, don't force people to tell their trauma. Um, don't force people. And one of the things we learn with trauma is that the slower you go, the faster you get there. One of the things with trauma is that when somebody expo experiences a trauma, the, the memory of the trauma is actually fragmented in their brain. They can't put it together. So when we force them to tell, to, when we force person to tell, to tell us, it's very difficult for them. Also, that if you enforcing persons to tell their traumatic story, you sometimes re-traumatize them. And if you do it, like if you have a group of children and you're telling them to share what happened, or others, what you may also do is traumatize the other persons in the room. In fact, a lot of times, people sit in my office and they're telling me their, tra their traumatic stories. I become traumatized in the process. It's an experience that we call dissociation, where your body, you begin to have a, an outer body experience. I sometimes, while the person is telling me about the trauma, I feel myself floating in the sky. And I'm not getting crazy or anything like that. But it's, it's trauma is very difficult to deal with, yes? And so the slower you go, the what? Faster you get there. This is a big one. This one triggered that discussion we had at breakfast this morning. Spare the rod or spoil the child. What's your opinion on that? I, I maintain, you know, that... Let me say persons in this room who was ever beaten by their parents. I have to run. And I'm going to tell you something. You have to be careful how I say this, but a lot of it is abusive, you know. That the reality in the Caribbean is that our, the way in which we discipline our children is harsh, sometimes brutal, and, that, and a lot of time it's traumatic. Yes? And we have to really look at how we discipline our children. And I know some of you are going to say, but how dare you say that? It worked for me. <laughs> and I'm going to share with you some tips in terms of what works. A non-judgmental approach. Um, that with your children, interactions that express kindness, patience, acceptance and listening. We have to listen to our children. They must become our best friends. Yes? But still in many homes in the Caribbean, children must be seen and not what? Heard. What hurts? Interactions that are humiliating, harsh, disrespectful, critical, demanding, judgmental. I touched on trauma, that, you know, when people experience trauma, they really should seek treatment, and we should encourage, if our children have been exposed to trauma, we should ensure that they get help. The greatest agony is that untold story inside of you. That's really a quote from Maya Angelou. I should have given her credit. And as I said earlier, do not force individuals to tell their story. The slower you go, the faster you get there. Listen to your children. 
many parents still think that children should be seen and not heard. And we should find time to sit and listen to our children. You should become your child's best friend. Show love and affection. Lots of love and affection. Children need love and they also have a need to feel love. Tell them you love them. And I hope the fathers do that too, right? And I say, you, you can, you can, you can, yes, yes. I hope you do that, right? But, but, because Caribbean fathers don't like to express their emotions, you know. Right? They don't like to express emotions. They think it's a sign of weakness. Um, and so, I get a lot of individuals who come to me, men, and they say, I grew up in a home and my father never ever said that he loved me. Yes? And this is a big man, and he's had to struggle with that all his life. Father never expressed love, care, concern. Spend time with our children. For children, love is spelled T-I-M-E, time. Spend quality time with your child. I know most of us know that, right? I'll skip this one. Communicate, communicate, communicate. And I want to spend time on this one. Do not communicate a new message. Communicate using a message. And you may ask, what is that? We did it in a workshop yesterday. And I'm going to give you an example here. So you come home and your child is watching TV instead of doing homework. Well, they should be watching TV probably on a Friday evening, right? And you're up, well, you're probably upset, angry, because you've told that child to do homework all week. And you know what we do? We speak to them in your message. You're worthless. You're no good. You're a failure. And it's the you messages. And you know what you messages do? They attack and they put down and they destroy the child's self-esteem. I remember one evening I was doing therapy with a lady. It was late. And I yawned. And she started to cry. And I said to myself, what is happening now? So I had to get myself out of it and I said, I notice you're yawning. Um, it probably has some significance to you. Tell me about it. And she was saying, Doc, I feel that you don't. You think I'm boring and you don't like me. And then she started to tell me that she grew up in a home where she was always put down and told that she would um, not achieve anything. And it turned out she was the only member in her family who actually made it to college. She had self-esteem. I mean, poor self-esteem. And this was because she was constantly put down and spoken to in you, given you messages. And let me tell you, and, and we're going to spend a little time on it. Not too much time, but some time, the you message. It, we use you messages in all areas of our life. Yesterday I was telling the group that, um, let's say your minister's wife, she owes you money. Um, or your the, the priest or whoever and she promised that she would have paid you the money from last Christmas now Christmas is coming again and you want your money because you want to buy a new sofa right and you go to your bed every night and you're perplexed you don't know what to say to her anytime you can't say something to somebody it means that you haven't got the communication right and it's always good to use what we call I message, and I'll come to that. So you're struggling, don't know what to say to the minister's wife, and you have to get it right because this is the time of the year when they elect people to the board of deacons or deaconess, and you want to be elected, so you can't offend this lady, yes? So I'm going to show you how we could communicate to her in, without being offensive. Um, because if you use your message, you, you probably go to her and say, well, you promised me my money. You told me I was going to, I would get it December. Easter came, you promised me. You're not somebody who keep your word. You are unreliable. And you're a minister's wife, you should be doing better. A lot of you messages, yes? And when we use you messages, people get very de defensive, yes? What you need to use is what we call I message. 
And so, when you walk into the house and your 12 year old is watching television, instead of saying, you this, you that, you worthless, you no good, how would you feel? You feel what? Probably what? Upset. So we're all, we're going to repeat it. I feel upset, everybody. Because you have not, actually that is bad, we should take out the you. Because the homework is not done. Let's repeat it. Because the what? Homework is not done. And what I want is for you to do your homework. How does that, how does that sound? Much better. So let's work the minister's wife now. How would you feel? You feel? Feel upset? What about disappointed? Yes? Yes, I feel disappointed because... What's that? Alright, the funds were not paid as promised, right? And what I want is what? Very good. You know, wives have a problem with their husband not remembering the wedding anniversary, right? And I'm going to give you a tool to use when you go home. No more, but you didn't remember my wedding anniversary. You're forgotten again. Um, you're no good. And the neighbor next door, he always remembers his wife for the wedding anniversary. You message, right? And then the husband storms out through the door, right? And the marriage is in chaos. A lot of times, relationships are in trouble. By the time they come to us as therapists, it's because we are using too much what? You message. Communication has gone bad. So let us do this one. So what should the wife say? She would be feeling what? Upset. No, let's be, no, can't use upset again. Give me another feeling word. Disappointed, yes. Because what? Because what? Because the anniversary is forgotten. And what I want for you to do is to what? Remember. Isn't that soft and gentler? Try it. Let me tell you something. This I message. In fact, I tell you, you the students are here. You want to work on your teacher next week? You didn't, you didn't do your homework, right? And I see some teachers here. So what you're going to say to your teacher? Let's use an I message. I feel, I feel bad. Yes, I feel tired because what? The homework, the distress, the homework was not what done. And what I would want is what? Excellent. And let me tell you. Let me tell you, it works if you work it, all the time. It what? works if you what? work it. So we're going to, when we leave here this evening, we're going to use more what? I message. And we're going to change our pattern of what? Communication. And we'll enjoy better what? Well-being, social well-being. And our home life will be happier, school life will be happier. I messages, they work. It works if you work it. Another important one, we have to remind ourselves, praise your child. Praise your child when they do something good. Do not always respond to the negative. Say things such as, thank you for washing the dishes. That makes me feel proud. And you express your emotions. Or I feel proud when the dishes are washed. And what I want is for you to continue to do that, right? I message. Let me tell you. And we should use a more non-judgmental approach. Avoid why questions. You know, I'll give you a good one. Like when parents bring their children to see me smoking, they suspect they're smoking, and they drag them into the office. And you know the child doesn't want to see the psychiatrist. Psychiatrists are hated, yes? And that child will probably not open up. And I will say, 
In fact, I remember once I sat, I used a technique silence, and I sat with a student for 45 minutes. She wouldn't speak, and I sat there, and I remained silent. And then after 45 minutes, she started to smile, and then started to get, we started to talk. But, so, young man comes into the office, mother suspect that he's smoking marijuana. And I'm not going to say, why are you smoking marijuana? Why questions are bad, they're judgmental. You ask, you say, I say, probably say something like this. You know, young people, many young people have reasons for smoking. And they do. The pain, they have reasons. Yes? And I am interested in hearing your reason or reasons and I sometimes touch my heart and say I'm sincerely honestly interested in hearing what you're saying and the moment you say that you're not judgmental and they open up stop the right questions they're judgmental why did you do that? Do, do that doctors do it you know patients don't take their medication and the patient walks in and you probably experience that right why didn't you take your medication and you walk out feeling badly about the experience and it's because you feel as if you were talking to maybe at, well we sometimes use the expression primary school teachers right but not all primary school teachers do that but you feel belittled yes. why did you not take your medication why did the doctor speak to me like that and what you really what would have made a difference is that the doctor would say should say i notice you haven't take on your medication what are your reasons for not taking them because as doctors we know the majority of patients don't take medication because of side effects and just asking a question what are your reasons the person will not shut down the person as we would if we'd use the why question what are the reasons and they'll tell the doc I get a headache I'm itching on my skin or something like that why questions are bad so the what question what are the reasons good questions or the mother who goes into the child's room and she saw a condom right and what is this what you already know what it is and it's a set of question because if the child says it's a condom and it's a harsh style of discipline the child might get a slap so the easy way to escape is to say no and then you're told that you lie so we should avoid avoid the set of questions and it could be something like this i notice a condom in your room can we sit and talk about this let's speak to our children you want me to do this or are we for time deep breathing exercise so we've got you laughing and so on right and sometimes we get um, very anxious like some of you probably get home tonight and um, you find that you get into your bed and you can't sleep because your thoughts are racing ever happened to you it happens to me all the time yes or i'm anxious or some people get panic attack i was telling the group yesterday for years i would treat panic attack and never appreciated what a panic attack was until I was on an aircraft, but it was on the tarmac for about 45 minutes, and it was getting hot. And I felt as if everything was caving in, and my heart started to race fast. And I was sweating, and my head was expanding. And I was saying to myself, I'm getting a heart attack. And I was about to push the button to call the flight attendant, or I was saying to myself, should I just scream? And something said to me, you're having a panic attack ever had that experience and a voice said to me good voice um, <laughs> voice said to me do your deep breathing and i did my deep breathing exercise and i relaxed my heart slowed down sweating stopped and i said but this is a panic attack so if you're having panic attack this will work deep breathing exercise so i'm going to just allow us to do it quickly what i want everybody to do just relax yourself 
close your eyes. Nobody is going to pick your purse or anything like that. And what we're going to do, we're going to relax ourselves. We're going to breathe in through our nostril. Breathe in gently. And while you're breathing in, just focus on the air going down. And then what you do is breathe out gently through your mouth. So in through your nostrils, focus on your breath, and then hold it a little, and then breathe out through your mouth. Breathe in as if you're smelling a rose, breathe out as if you're blowing a leaf. So everybody, in, keep doing it, very good. Excellent. Very good. How was that? You realize how relaxing it is? You'd be surprised. Breathing solves a lot of problems, especially anxiety and so on. So if you have a tendency to be anxious, students before your exam, excellent thing to do. Even during your exam, you can do it a little, right? Um, stuck in the traffic, practice your deep breathing exercise. It works if you work, work it. Now, everybody in this room, that's free consultation. You pay me one dollar for it. That's only. You also know why I see why I have this dollar. Now, for the teachers, there's, there's some excellent resources around, you know. Um, there's actually a, a site, Teachers Pay Teachers, and I think you have a lot of material you can access. Now, nowadays, we have a lot of mental health apps. There's an app for everything. And if you go online, you see a lot of mental health apps that we can use. And so, as I come to an end, there's an activity. So I'm going to invite two students to come. I'm a surprise for you. Come on. Just do your deep breathing. Don't be anxious. I'm told I should make it stressful. I know you all go to a lovely girls' school, but I'll try not to let you do anything unladylike, right? What we're going to do, what do we have here? It's a, a dollar, right? So what I'm going to do, what do you, well, you, you want to hold it? And what I'm going to tell you to do, crush it for me. Crush it, hard, crush it. And you're going to throw it to the floor. Yes, and you can stomp on it. You, you, yes. You notice how ladylike it is? She's well brought up. Right? Don't Yes. And... So you crush it, you throw it to the floor, stamp it. You want to take it up? I'll take it up for you. And then, I want you to look at it. Has it, has it lost its value? No. It hasn't, right? There's a lesson. As young people, no matter how crushed you are, how much you're thrown to the ground, and you're stomped on, you'll never use, lose your value, right? Let's give them a hand. And for coming, we have a ball each. Thank you. And so, as I come to a close, I just want to remind us, it takes a village to raise a child. And so I'm glad as members of the university community, teachers, educators, parents, friends, we're all here to remind ourselves it takes a village to raise a child. And in closing, let me end with a message from a little boy. And this is it. If I were born with all of my knowledge at birth, I would have said to my parents something like this. As I grow, push, but do not shove. Talk, but do not scream. Teach, but do not lecture. Hold me, but do not pull me. Guide, 
but do not take my place. And lastly, love me without measure. I thank you. Can we hear it one more time for Professor Eagle? Thank you, Professor, for that insightful, thought-provoking, and I'd venture to say engaging presentation. Um, I'm sure it has taken us a step further in becoming more student-centered, mindful, and mindful of mental health issues um, that affect the teaching and learning experience. And perhaps it has made us more equipped um, with the tools to address these issues. I see you have some more stress balls there that hopefully you might be distributing. With trauma, the how does it go? The slower you go. One person, everybody has <laughs> aces, students. Any? What are the three? Tell me. Tell me what you remember about the aces. Adverse childhood experiences. All right. So you got a ball. So you you can get yours now. So come on down. Oh, you got. She has a ball as well. <laughs> What's that? I give her Oh, you give her. All right, you're a good, kind student. Let's give her. Let's give her a round of applause. It's always good. Be careful now. It's always good to share. All right, what's the other one? Who can construct an I message for me? Who will construct? That's a difficult one. A child for the children. <laughs> Young person who will volunteer. What's that? Somebody. Come. All right. And I'm glad a male is actually doing it, because you know, males don't like to express emotions. Let's hear. I feel hurt that I have an assignment to do. So I think an extension would be nice. Let's give it to it. I feel very encouraged because you made a great attempt. What I want you to do is continue to use your eye message. All right. Sheen, I know you, have, you deserve one, right? For your excellent job. Don't get jealous now. All right. So thanks for everybody. Thanks again. <laughs> We are delighted to accommodate any questions you may have regarding Professor Abel's presentation. So just feel free to raise your hand and a mic will be... Please make them easy. <laughs> Friday evening. <laughs> okay, noted. Good evening everyone. Um, my name is Monique, Dr. Professor Abdel. An excellent presentation. Um, very engaging. And I appreciate the content that you shared. Um, my question is with respect to a statement that you made where you connected trauma with a drop in IQ. Um, what would you recommend in terms of, um, I guess, treatment um, techniques that can be used to reduce the effects of it in that regard? Good question. Well, firstly, it's important for us to appreciate trauma and the, how we define trauma, the abuse, neglect, um, 
exposures within the household and not to take these things for granted especially in societies where we have high levels of exposure to trauma to recognize that especially our children um, may be and can be um, affected and that we should be on the alert especially at home within the community um, within the educational system to recognize that trauma does in fact affect children and others and that when they are so exposed that they should be referred so that they can get appropriate treatment and intervention i don't know if that answers the question especially and i'll tell you especially all forms you know and for us to recognize i hope when you leave here this evening you will take a second and look at our, our child rearing practices which is sometimes as i said earlier can be harsh and abusive yes and recognize that sometimes what we're doing we are traumatizing our children and we're destroying them but sexual trauma is a big one that lots of time it happens in the house in the home in the community and we overlook it and that sometimes when the children report it we sometimes um, don't play ignore um, sexual trauma i find can be um, it's very difficult because for children it's really a, a, a violation of self um, what it represents is that the adults in the life of that child fail to protect the child yes and it's a betrayal of trust fundamental betrayal of trust and when children are abused sexually the impact is long term you see the physical scars may heal but the psychological scars take a long 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 time to heal if ever at all and what we find is that children who have gone through repeated when it's repeated and it's long term the trauma the abuse it impacts their development and it plays out in adulthood in fact you know we see we're seeing an increase in children cutting for example and i'm not saying every child that cuts um, has been sexually abused but we find that it raises a red flag a lot of time children who cut are in pain and they'll tell you the reason they cut is really because they're not feeling anymore they're feeling numb and they do that to feel or they sometimes do that to release their pain and a lot of time it's that untold story um, which is creating agony within the child and um, we need to be on the lookout that when it does occur sexual abuse or trauma we should ensure that children get adequate treatment yes to prevent the long-term impact i don't know if i answer your question <laughs> You're a top examiner, you know. <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> that's all right. I, I think what happened is that um, I understand you're saying you're through the psychology and you're through the treatment, which is going to take a lot longer to get into people's lives. What do you think you're going to do immediately to help? I mean, in combination with going to psychiatry or psychologists, what can the individual do as well to kind of help and kind of serve you? So, what do you mean in terms of the long-term impact? Well, you see, early, but firstly, an important thing is to recognize that these problems exist, right, and that they need intervention. But to prevent the long-term impact of trauma, it clearly has to stop, and it can only stop if you recognize it's a problem. One and two, you refer the person for appropriate intervention. Yes, but it's it's what is most problematic are those children who are exposed to repeated long long-term um, exposure to trauma, especially in some communities. I think we have one in the back. 
Evening, Dr. Weber. I really appreciate the links that you made in terms of children and households. Um, I'm glad you brought up the link in terms of prison numbers and mental health and how do we complicate that when children come from spaces where intimate partner violence happens. And I also wanted to possibly add to the mix in terms of loss for young people that when they leave school, after they've had those connections, because I actually had a conversation recently with a preschool teacher, and she has now to start a little earlier in terms of allowing the children to disengage from her, but she's actually implemented a place where when the children leave the space, they can actually call her. And I think sometimes too we discredit when young people actually either have a crush or actually do fall in love with someone else, they loss either when the person moves on or doesn't and actually take it on. So sometimes young people do suffer a loss that yes, we sometimes categorize as adult space, but we diminish it because we think it, in a young person's life, it's not real. Thanks for those comments. And you're right that we must recognize a loss is a loss is a loss. Mm -hmm. And that every human being, even a child, um, if they are old enough to appreciate and recognize a loss, is going to grieve and that grieving is normal, it's natural, and it's universal in that almost everybody who experiences a loss is going to go through the grieving process. Yes? So when persons come to me as a psychiatrist, I don't necessarily jump to write a prescription for somebody who is grieving, right? A lot of times, you know, all you have to tell people is that, look, in fact, I remember someone said, well, lady came, her marriage broke up and she was grieving the breakup, the loss of the marriage, her husband. And this lady was a senior executive and she broke down in tears and so on. And all I did was just spend some time and explain to her that what, what is happening to you is that you're, you're grieving and that this is normal. The feelings you're having, they're normal, they're real, yes? And they're natural. This is how we respond to a loss. And chances are, most people, this is how they respond. And she looked at me and said, you know, thank you very much for helping me to just accept and realize that, yes? And she said goodbye, didn't come back, right? <laughs> That's all. But another period in life where, at which we have to deal with loss is that as we get older, I'm beginning to grieve because I'm approaching retirement, so I have to deal with it. And there are nights I get anxious about it and I have to do my deep breathing, right? But retirement is a crisis, can be a crisis point for many persons. And you know, when a lot of people get to the point of retirement, they're upset. Oh, they're pushing me out of the job. Yes? They're letting the young people take over. Yes? And when they leave the, 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 the workplace, oh, the things are not the same as when we were there. Yes? And the reality is that when we enter the workforce, we know that there's an end point. We leave at a particular age. And so we have to prepare ourselves for that. And sometimes, despite the best of preparations, we're going to go through a grieving process. And it's important that we recognize that, right? And then as we get older, there's loss in terms of your health, children have left home, um, your friends are dying, they're falling all around you. I find now I'm going to more funerals than um, ever in my life. And in a sense, I said to myself, you know, somehow life is preparing me to deal with death. That's part of the reality. But the reality is that as we get older, we have to deal with a lot of losses in our lives and we grieve and we have to recognize that grieving is what it is. It is normal and it is what? Natural. Okay? And children do grieve. Yes. All right. We have, this will probably be the last question for the afternoon, for the evening. Uh, oh, we have one. Hi. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Abel. I, I just have two Quick questions. One is, given the prevalence of certain patterns in the Caribbean, do you think there are possibly colonial or historical factors that could be associated with some of the, some of the prevalent patterns you've described? And secondly, from a modern perspective, you mentioned using apps that are available, but are there any caveats that you'd wish to 
supply regarding using apps that are readily available. And All right. Okay, thanks for that. Well, I suppose we have to make sure that they are culturally appropriate. That's number one. Um, and that they are from credible sources. I think those are the big ones because lots of times these apps are um, made, they're prepared for another population and may not be appropriate for us. And certainly if you're advocating it for use um, in, in your children, adolescents, as parents, you have to make sure you screen what is being used and so on. But let me go back to the, let me touch the historical issues. Um, and when we talk about history in the Caribbean, what comes to mind? It's a word we don't like to talk about sometimes, right? But, um, you know, nowadays we talk about the, and I alluded to it, the transgenerational transmission of, of trauma. And um, it is thought, well, I mean, we do know now that, you know, with, with chronic repeated exposure to trauma, and you know, slavery was a very trauma traumatic experience which occurred over centuries, right? In some countries, longer than others. In fact, there's a book. I appreciate how traumatic slavery was in Jamaica after having read a book called In, Vis in Miserable Slavery by Douglas Hall. And for those of you interested in um, psychology and so on, it's a book that you should read. Um, but the point is it slavery is a brutal um, experience. And what we do know is that when people experience chronic exposure to stress and trauma, apart from the, the, the I, I mentioned earlier that it's, it's really toxic stress and it rewires, it hardwires the brain. The brain changes over time. But also, your genes actually undergo some change in genetic expression. And as a result, what you find is that there's what we refer to as a transgenerational um, transmission of patterns of thinking, of attitude and behavior that will come with, with, with some of these chronic exposure to stress, um, such as community violence, experience of slavery, and so on. It's an erudite um, explanation, and I don't know if I've gotten to the point, and it's, it's clear enough, but refer to this as epigenetic changes that occur inside of, in terms of our genes, that, that, that any chronic exposure to stress violence will actually change the genetic expression. All right. For the sake of time, I think we've come to the end of our question and answer segment. Um, but should you have any other questions, ideas, or even suggestions, um, or comments for Professor Abel and his presentation, please feel free to speak with him during our reception later this afternoon, later this evening. Is that okay, Prof? All right. I'm not hearing voices. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, All right, I now invite Dr. Margot Baines, along with Ms. Kyra Kujo, Group Events Manager, Guardian Group, to present a token of appreciation to Professor Abel. Okay. Oh, here. It's marketing. Thank you so much. You really love it. Thank you very much. Thank you. We don't have a lot of time to have a lot of time. Oh, yes. Lots of people. We can try it for you. All right. Let's go to this one. All right. Thanks. Yes. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Okay, then. thanks. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.